So, welcome to this session of the uh, retreat. It's a Zoom retreat. It's supposed to be the last session for, for me, but who knows? Often the case is that you think it's the last session, and then sometimes uh, you have these uh, memories, a result of brainwashing, even in your ears, somebody told me that they were on a retreat, and even though after the retreat, they kind of heard, heard me sort of saying, like, relax to the max, and all these other phrases. It doesn't really stop, because all those instructions, if they really work, they stay inside your mind, and you really, really get very, very deep with these. But anyway, I'm not supposed to be teaching uh, a Dhamma talk, but leading a guided meditation. So please, everybody, if you can, uh, just close your eyes. Now I'm going to focus, instead of actually sweeping through the body, this, the earlier meditation, I just couldn't get past my feet, even. It's a weird thing to say, but the feet became so relaxed, I stayed there. And then just went into some nice, please excuse me, like limiters. It's the mind, that's all it needed, a place to get started, a place to get some mindfulness. And now I'm going to ask you, so can you be aware of your head? How did your head feel? On top of your neck. Forget about the rest of the body, let that just be what supports your head. But in your head especially, just between your ears, and a couple of inches behind your eyes, you've got this thing called your brain. Usually, you're not supposed to be able to sense any feelings in the brain. That's an advantage you can make use of. You can just imagine the feelings in your brain. Just imagine how tired your brain can be sometimes. Been working hard. Just been making some tough decisions in life. Been struggling with your brain. Can you imagine any feelings, sensations inside that brain? And give the brain, once you've got some uh, connection with your brain, even though it may only be an imaginary connection, Imagine that once you have connected, then you give some loving kindness to your poor brain. You're working hard, serving you, serving other people. You have gratitude towards this brain of yours. You know how it just will work for you day and night sometimes. So now you imagine that brain being really tired. It's just imagination. What I sometimes do, I imagine finding this little uh, my door handle, or my only small door handle, like a little knob, on top of my head. And I pull it to open up my skull. I can see my brain inside the skull, really tired. My, and this is totally impossible, but just imagine it's possible. Imagine taking up your poor brain, lifting it so gently out of the skull, and put it in this nice little basket with a very beautiful cushion covered in, I don't know, satin, laying your poor brain on that little cushion, covering it with another um, blanket, the pillow under the top of it, and say, little brain, have a rest. This is safe here. So you give your brain a place to sleep for a few minutes. You can change those instructions 
make sure your little brain is comfortable and it doesn't need to do any work for the next half an hour. You are free just to be peaceful, to relax and rest. What happens with that type of imaginary exercise? It's like the whole body can relax because the engine which drives it is relaxing, becoming peaceful. Of course, this is only an imaginary exercise, but it serves the purpose of suggesting that your whole neural framework of being can be peaceful, can be still. And how does that feel on your body? When I do that, I feel everything in my body, in my arms, in my chest, in my back, in my butt, in my legs, the whole body relaxing because the source of all movement, tightness, tension, reaction, the brain is disconnected for a few minutes. It's just imagination. And this is what works. The body is perfectly healthy and it just loves that feeling of relaxation, of resting. It does not need to react. You feel that. The sensation of allowing your whole body to be peaceful. Because what drives it and reacts has been given time out, given a place where it can rest, recuperate, because you're kind to it. How does that body feel? And then I focus not on so much on the body, but the feelings in the body, the feelings of peace. It's kind of a physical feeling first. And then that kind of melts into the emotional feeling of peace. Got nothing to do, nowhere to go. You can't do anything. Your brain's been put asleep for a few minutes. And it needs it. You can't think, assess. You just experience. The experience of peace in this moment. No past, no future. Even the present kind of disappears. You're still aware, despite for many of us, we need a past and future to understand what the present is. When the present starts to establish and become unmoving, it's like the past and future don't make sense either. You've left the prison of time, kind of free. And enjoy that feeling of freedom. Please never feel afraid of the pity sukha, the joy and bliss of meditation. When it happens, let it come into your mind like the most welcome of guests. The joy, the happiness of the mind creates the causes for deeper stillness and deeper insight. I always notice when I recognize and meditate on the joy of relaxation, the, react, the relaxation goes deeper than I've ever experienced. So positive. Once I can be aware of that feeling of relaxation, not just in the body, but the sensations of the body, into the mind. My mind becomes satisfied with that joy of meditation. I just allow it to stay there. 
I don't make it stay there. Because I recognize it wants to stay there. It's happy being quiet, being still, being at ease. And if you can, just let that joy of relaxation, the pity sutta, let that establish itself as your main object of meditation. You try and capture it, it will flee. If you let it be and respect it, it will stay. And if you're lucky, that feeling of joy and happiness very easily turn into one of these beautiful lights in the mind, what we call the limiters. It's easy to stay there because it's fun and delightful. You don't need to take notes. You don't need to describe. You can imagine this beautiful light in the mind in silence. The less you say, the less you think, the more that light is still. And don't be afraid of it, it gets very strong and brilliant. It's what it's supposed to do. There is no danger. Allow the mind to enjoy seeing a reflection of itself in the mirror of mindfulness, the beautiful limiters. Of course, I'll be quiet now. See what happens.
Getting close to the end of this meditation period. You need to invite your brain back inside your head. The lovely rest. Thank you, dear. Feel it, imagine it in the space of thank you. The gratitude to you. To the brain back inside this home. You can know how your body feels. How the mind enjoys peace so much. Know what freedom really means. Freedom from wanting anything. In surprise. Now I invite you to open your eyes. And this meditation. You really want to continue fine. For those who wish to go to the toilet, please do so. A five minute break. Do we two questions? Questions and answers. Maybe five minute break. So now, ten past the time for the questions and answers. Has anyone got any questions? Or shall we just close our eyes and just go here meditating? Uh, I think almost everyone has a question, including people who haven't asked before. So, um, okay. a couple from this room, too. So I'd okay. like to start with them. Okay, great. Here we go. You'll like this one. <laughs> I've heard people talk about nimittas as a distraction, a sign of progress, and also something some people never get. For example, I've never had a visual nimitta, but sometimes sound. What do you think about them, nimittas? <sighs> First of all, don't just believe or trust me. Look at Majiminikaya 128, Sutta 128, the Upakilesa Sutta. It's a beautiful sutta, which I read out in Bangkok recently, in the retreat which I gave. It starts off you know, with the bad things happening. The Sangha at Kosambi had an argument, and after arguing, the Buddha left them. And one of the places he went after leaving this arguing monastery was with these three monks, Anuruddha, Kimbala, and Nandia. And of those three monks, he asked them how they lived. And they lived hardly speaking to each other. And they would always look after each other. They said, you know, that their fellow monks thought was the same as theirs. So they lived so peacefully and kindly towards each other. And then the Buddha, I think Anuruddha, asked them about these nimittas, what happens? And then the Buddha said that you know, before his enlightenment, he'd experienced a problem with these lights and forms in the mind. This is what we're talking about. It mentioned those as nimittas and all the reasons why that they're not really established. And and then he taught these three monks, three monks who became great arahats, how to actually to use these nimittas. And sometimes it was too much excitement. And it's obvious, these are beautiful things. Sometimes it's fear, 
the fear comes because they're powerful. And we know we cannot control them. We just let them be and then they settle down. Sometimes we're moving around too much, they didn't last. And again, it's because one's too much effort, trying too hard. These are essential that to get into deep meditations. They're beautiful, they happen to almost everybody. And if you don't get those nimittas before you die, when you do die, you go towards the light. What do you think that is? The five senses are vanishing, a death. And when you go towards the light, you can enter that light. And that becomes merging into the nimitta. It's anyone who says that you know, these aren't taught by the Buddha does not know what they're talking about. So I just straight away quoted the text where you can find those quotes in there. Number two is it just happens whether you try to uh, create them or not, when you get really still and you develop the joy, that's why I ask you to focus on the joy, make it important for you. And then those nimittas happen automatically. And they're absolutely gorgeous. They really tend to weaken uh, your um, hindrances. So your mind is much more peaceful, much more powerful. And you can use uh, sound nimittas but you can work with the light limiters much more easily. That's one of the reasons why the Buddha usually said that the sight is the most well used of our five senses. And because of that, that it's the easiest to actually visualize an limiter with sight. And then you have more opportunity to calm it down, to make it brilliant, to make it still. It's a gorgeous thing. I know that some people have said that's just in the in the commentaries of Buddhism. It's not. Straight in the suttas. And again, I just quoted it, Majima 128. When he taught those three monks, please develop them, make use of them. And you go right into the center of them, and that's where you find the, the jhanas. Well, yeah, the, they're brilliant, absolutely important. What about the sound limiters, Ajahn? The sound limiters, you can make use of that. They are real limiters. But, but one of the signs it's a real limiter is that if it's a color, it's a more beautiful color than you can ever see in the world. It's like a blue, it's a deep, gorgeous, incredible, powerful blue. And you can't replicate that in the world. If it's a sound, it's not a sound which you know you can often just that's like a violin or a flute or anything. It's much more beautiful than that. It's still, it's not actually a sound, it's not a light, it's not a feeling in the body, it is just a mind object. But when we have a beautiful mind object like that, we you know we try and give it a name afterwards. What actually is that? And so everyone sees a limiter exactly the same. It is a mind object. It's not of the other five senses. That's why it's more pure and brilliant. But we interpret it. We give it the name as a sound or as a light or as a beautiful feeling. And it's much, I always encourage people, Yes, sound are limiters, but the best thing is if you can just look at that like a light, interpret it as a light, it's easier to work with. Thank you, Ajahn. Okay, another one from here. So, dear Ajahn, much appreciation for your guidance on this retreat. Could you suggest how to approach the three types of dukkha, particularly psychological and existential, with curiosity and interest? What are some examples of what to look out for within these types of dukkha that could be a feature to examine more closely? Okay, sometimes, uh, just some of my own experiences when I was a young man, you may think this is small, but for me it was keeping me up all night, having a really bad uh, toothache over in Thailand. And because it was such a bad toothache and there was no medication, we can't call a doctor because there's no telephones, no electricity. But then 
But what really made me learn about dukkha was actually nowhere to run. And I couldn't, as, this is how Ajahn Chah taught it to me. You can't go forward, you can't go back, you can't stay still. All your options are just removed. You know, you're kind of, you're not, your back is against the wall. There is no wall to bend your back against. It was, it was very frustrating. You're at your wit's end. And so it's only when you get to those extremes of pain, physical pain we're talking about now, that you remember just some of the things your teachers tell you. Let go. What letting go meant was let go and trying to get rid of it, let go and trying to change it. Just leave it, let it be. And that was the first time in my life I did letting be. And it just blew my mind. One moment you couldn't stand just being here, it was just way too painful. And the next moment you were blitzing out. The contrast was unbelievable. That's what happens when you let be. When you stop, you stop fighting. And when you know what, when suffering is there and then suffering disappears, it's like the old simile of the uh, tadpole and the frog, which I hope many of you know. If you don't know it, I'm sure you can ask one of the, the nuns afterwards they so know it so well. Once that suffering is gone, then you know what it is. That's the physical suffering. And the emotional suffering is, I don't want this, why me, it shouldn't happen to me. That after a while, that emotional suffering is harder to overcome. But you can do that when you find that that emotional suffering will learn how to be here. You're not fighting it, you're learning from it, you're respecting it. Even emotional pain sometimes happens. And the only way to fully understand it is to learn from it. So, you know, it's kind of not quite the same, but when Ajahn Chah, when I complained to Ajahn Chah about mosquitoes, he told me, just, you know, it's not the mosquitoes which are disturbing you, all those Ajahn mosquitoes. And light sound, he said, you disturb the sound. I disturbed the mosquitoes. At first of all, I thought he didn't understand me. Then I understood later on that when you allow these things to be, accept them, because you can't get rid of them. When you accept them, then they disappear. Weird, doesn't make kind of logical sense, but that's what happens. If you try and accept them, making a deal with them. I'll accept you as long as you disappear. I'll give you three minutes, okay? No, you haven't gone in three minutes. It's not like a strategy to get rid of these things. It's learning how to be with them, accept them. And then they don't sting anymore. I'm talking about just even toothaches or other emotional problems. Got quite a lot of questions coming, so I'll get to okay. Them. I'll try and be shorter. <laughs> yeah, in today's amazing, inspiring talk, Ajahn gave, um, does to liberate by letting go also mean to accept everything as cause and effect? Does that mean the will and the choices we think we make, e.g., to do wholesome actions, are conditioned and there's no free will? Yeah, they are conditioned, there appears to be free will. But after a while, one understands the best will to condition you is coming from like a noble one. And if you can allow and listen to hang out with noble beings, after a while, the, you know, you think what they think, you say what they think, you do what they do. And you may believe it's your will, you decided to sit down and meditate and let go. After a while, you realize, you no, know, you were just conditioned by that. You allowed us to be. They're so beautiful and so peaceful. All the things we ever wanted. This is what happens. Actually, nothing happens. That's what you really wanted. Peace, stillness, freedom. A uh, slightly longer question now. In one of his books, Ajahn Chah said something that I struggle to fully understand. 
Would you enlighten us please on the meaning of the following? Right practice is steady practice. Whether standing, walking, sitting or reclining, the practice must continue. For example, when you finish sitting in meditation, remind yourselves that you're not actually finishing meditation, you're simply changing postures. Your mind is still composed. Whether standing, walking, sitting or reclining, you have sati with you, that's mindfulness. If you have this kind of awareness, you can maintain your internal practice. In the evening when you sit again, the practice continues uninterrupted. Your effort is unbroken allowing the mind to attain calm. Sometimes I read books about Ajahn Chah and then I have to read it again. Is this who Ajahn Chah, is this Ajahn Chah they're talking about? When Ajahn Chah passed away, remember going over to Wat Pa Pong to pay my respects, that is, especially at his death and at his funeral. And I remember we had a big discussion. What did Ajahn Chah really teach? And I remember all these senior monks, we started arguing. What did Ajahn Chah really teach? And I remember you know, my predecessor in Perth, Ajahn Jakara, he summed it up beautifully. He said, everyone who listened to Ajahn Chah has different memories of him. And from those memories, we build up our Ajahn Chah. And sometimes some of the translations which you see in books like that, that doesn't sound like Ajahn Chah to me. You'd always like to see the, the Thai or the Laotian if she spoke. And that's much easier, you know, to understand exactly what Ajahn Chah said. Sometimes the translations are more about the translator than Ajahn Chah. And so how I uh, understood Ajahn Chah, it wasn't always just having mindfulness of different levels of mindfulness. Even a drunken person going home from the pub has enough mindfulness to find his way home. However he does that, I just don't know. But nevertheless, there's a tiny bit of mindfulness left. Is that what maintaining mindfulness means? Or is there something deeper than that? And one of the things is the striving, the effort. That I often ask questions about when I was in Thailand, and no one really gave me a good answer. And what the effort is, is restraining not trying to get something, not trying to maintain your mindfulness, but finding what the causes of mindfulness are and maintaining them. Getting this beautiful sense of basically non-self virtue, uh, always managing to keep precepts, the precepts of non-harming. I often tell people if you can't keep five precepts or eight precepts or 311 precepts of a bhikkhuni, 227 of a monk, at least keep the two precepts. That's never harming another being, never harming oneself. Pretty simple, but incredibly profound. Okay. Yeah, Ajahn, this morning I was doing some yoga in the garden, and in one moment I was fascinated by the clouds in the sky. I immediately said to myself, what a beautiful sky today. Was I still watching the sky then or did I stop perceiving the reality? I felt good, no. after, but I suppose the good feeling came from the thought and not from the reality. If so, any advice how to stop the instant commentary? Now, when I was learn, listening to you there, you didn't start with the commentary, you started with the experience. And after a while, if you notice that when you first saw the beautiful sky, you never talked about it, you never thought about it, that thought came in afterwards. And it's if you can maintain the silence, the joy and the peace will last much longer. It'll be far more delightful. You know, if you experience that enough after a while, you don't really want to describe it. Because the joy of it is far better. 
We can't capture things with thoughts, with approximations. And after a while, you just let, especially if you're very peaceful and mindful, you remember them. You don't need to write them down or try and forget and try and remember them. Those beautiful mind, beautiful experiences of mindfulness. Look, I just remember one of my earliest, one of them, earliest memories was at school, primary school. And you know, I was quite smart, so I remember in the representing greenhouse that was the little part of the school where i went to but uh it's only a primary school for poor kids but i must say that i only found out recently one of the other kids who went to that school was about three or four years ahead of me was the actor who became professor snape in harry potter movies so we went to the same school <laughs> <laughs> and I don't think you and people say Professor Snape was very scary. And I hope I don't come out to be very scary. But nevertheless, that I do remember once, you know, on this little kids, you know, house intelligence test quiz show, that somebody asked a that the teacher asked a question, and I was the only one in the whole school who knew the answer. And also I remembered exactly when the teacher told us that. So it was a bit weird, I admit it. But that was because I was mindful. When the teacher talked, I paid full attention. My mind was quiet. And I loved that feeling. When the mind just enjoyed the solitude and the peace, because the mind was peaceful. And it never was you know, giving back chat to the beauty which you experience. With nature. I hope that makes sense. Okay, question. <laughs> Just simply placing my mind on the underside of my foot and scanning the toes and lower foot. The mind became very engaged with this all by itself. And emotionally, my mind also got very high and peaceful. Should I continue this feeling at one point? Very quiet inside as well. Should I continue this meditation after the retreat? Basically, don't make that your main meditation. Otherwise, we start a new tradition, not a breath meditation or a personal meditation, foot meditation. <laughs> it worked for you then simply because, number one, it was original unique and you've never done that before i'm sure and that meant it was very easy for your mind to engage with it if you keep doing that again and again and again it will lose it will lose some of its power so it's nice to have a few things you can turn to you know that every now and again to remember oh i'll try that um foot meditation you know, I think I mentioned to you that this one time I just uh, combined loving kindness and breath meditation. And that was just so powerful. So I can do it again, but it's never as powerful. So usually I just do the ordinary meditation. That's powerful enough. It's nice to have a little bit of variety in your meditation. The main thing you're developing this is the ability to let go peace, stillness, focusing on a small aspect of life, or your toe, or your breath, or loving kindness, or whatever, and then learning how just to transcend from the feelings of the body to how the mind experiences these things, and then into peace and into limiters. Okay. Hey, this is a question for you, Ajahn, about you. Which one question or conundrum do you remember as a younger monastic that made a significant impact on you after receiving an answer from a teacher? <laughs> that one I cannot remember. A lot of these things you let go of. The one thing which comes to my mind right now is a story I said about Ajahn Chah asking why. And I said, I don't know. 
and know all the sort of the background to that as well. And eventually he told me the answer is there's nothing. It was just the situation which he told me and the fact that at the time I felt stupid, but I realized even though I was stupid, he must have seen something in me which could remember that answer and that penetrated eventually. So that was one of those beautiful answers. There's nothing. Ah, uh, okay. Thank you for the wonderful experience and your generous guidance. I'm also deeply grateful to Ben Chanda and Ben Upeka. I feel incredibly fortunate to witness the emergence of a bhikkhuni sangha. Can you please comment on the following aspects of my meditation practice? Sometimes my neck turns involuntarily during meditation and the breath follows. I stay with the breath but occasionally decide to count. Is this approach considered controlling? Additionally, I've had experiences where a light seems to emanate from within, starting from the level of the chest or below and moving upwards. The light was soft white and the second was more pinkish. Both times I got startled and the light disappeared when my attention shifted to it. What is happening here with immense gratitude? Okay, first thing, if your body starts moving, please let it. It's what the body wants to do. You don't control it. And secondly, that sometimes you have your eyes closed and you think you perceive your body is turning and it's absolutely not. I remember just one of the early retreats I gave in Perth, this woman said every time she meditates, her body twists around. But we hadn't seen that before. Mm. So I said, next meditation, I keep my eyes open and just examine you, watch you, you can trust me. And so I did that, and the body was perfectly still. It didn't move at all. And, I, and she said, did you see me moving? I said, you weren't moving, you were perfectly still. She said, yes, I was. And she wasn't. Sometimes your perceptions in meditation of your body moving or rising into the air or expanding or falling into the ground, you have those perceptions. They're just perceptions. They're not reality. So if those things actually do happen or you just perceive them, just leave them alone. I mean, don't reject them. Just enjoy those feelings and they pass. Once they pass, they probably won't come back again. And you can be even more peaceful and more deep. So those are not problems at all. Just enjoy them. Be patient. And if you feel there's like a light coming up through your body, there's one problem there is the real nimittas, they're not in the body, not outside the body, they're not off the body, they're beyond the body. It's a sign that your body is actually vanishing with its five senses. So if they start to arise, I wonder whether you actually perceive them in the body or that you're adding that perception to them. Try and disembody those beautiful lights and then you will find that they will sometimes Imagine like a screen for your mind. And then sometimes those nimitas start on one edge of the screen or one corner of the screen. And it's like they're testing you out. That's just, you know, a, a skillful means. They're not testing you out. They're not beings. They're just your mind. But it's like, are you willing? Are you peaceful enough to allow me to be with you? And sometimes if you are peaceful we said whenever you wish to come you can come if you don't want to come you don't have to come because i'd always respect you but it's up to you i'm not going to control you and then they usually come right in front of your center of your screen of your mind and they can really start to grow beautifully and brilliantly and colors the like of which i like yellow or blue or white or or whatever but they're more white than any white you've ever seen in your whole existence. And that's a really good sign. And that those are limiters. But I think sometimes I get too serious. So I had one of these unique limiters a few rage retreats ago, which I'd never heard any other meditation teacher experiencing. And it was a, it was an, oops, <laughs> it was a limiter. It was a beautiful nimitta, it was yellow in colour, a yellow like you haven't seen anywhere in the world before, more yellow than yellow, but it had a shape to it. 
And as soon as I recognized the shape, that's when the meditation fell apart. And the reason was it was a shape of Garfield, the cat. I'm the only one who's ever told people about the Garfield limiter. <laughs> it was because I was reading too many cartoons, you know, in the newspapers. That's the only part of the newspaper I usually read. <laughs> And I recognize that's what happens. Your mind is sensitive, it picks up things, and that's the perception which the mind allowed to happen. And I burst out laughing in my cave. So no one heard me, but I had to tell all the bucks about it afterwards so they could you know, be amused too. Okay. So these are limiters, but when a limiter comes, you can't control it. You have to be a friend to it. If you want to come, you can come. If you want to grow, you can grow. So it's totally up to you. Wherever you are on the screen of attention, you can stay there or you can come in the center. It's up to you. You're the passenger, never the driver. Got quite a lot more questions, Ajahn. So okay, keep going. We'll do go. as many as we can. All right. Thanks for the brainwashing. You're wondering if your online retreat talks are hitting the spot. They are doing that and much more. Your talks are changing my life. I experienced something you could call positive trauma. It started okay. the renunciation process in my life, and I've been living like a mini monastic for the past two years and lost interest in the Pulp Fiction world. <laughs> Meditation right. is deeper, and I have great confidence in the path. When Venchanda received a set of robes, that was yesterday, right. I wondered if they would fit me. I'm already 47, and the internal tyrant tells me I'm too old to become a nun. Do you have any suggestions on how to proceed on the renunciation path? You just basically just keep on renouncing. And don't ever think these robes are too small or too big. You just, you can always change robes. And, but don't try and get thinner or younger. This, I just, it kind of sort of hurts me, I must admit, that in some monasteries they say after a certain age, you, know, you can't ordain as a nun. Or as a monk, it's only because we need sometimes other monks to look after you. And that's, uh, but if you can practice and keep practicing, be healthy. And it's nice to renounce, to have less things. If you can renounce at home, great. Try and live simply. And, you know, for your friends and family, you know, try and uh, you know, at least keep a precepts. They don't need to look at entertainment and you don't need a meal in the evening unless for health reasons. Just keep it as simple as you can. And meditate as deeply as you can. Yeah, and by the way, 47 is not too old. No. But it starts with visiting monasteries. You have to take a step first before you yeah. fly in the robes. You have to take a little step. Uh, tinnitus can be a major impediment to meditation practice. Would you please advise us something about this? Thank you. Yeah, I do know there's one gentleman who had tinnitus and he would always want to go to our retreat centre to join meditation retreats. And he said it was the only place in the world where the tinnitus disappeared. And after he left, he would come back again. He was very, very old and eventually passed away. He said there was something about the meditation and the quiet of the retreat and that allowed him, he found a method that it actually kind of disappeared for him for days. I'm not sure exactly what he was doing or what he was up to, but that's what he said and he was very honest about it. But eventually he just passed away. So, just do some more meditation. And eventually, uh, I don't know sure how it works, but maybe the tinnitus or we get sort of softer, it's not such a hindrance for you, and you can become really, really peaceful upon these moments when the tinnitus is gone. This is just what I talk with him about. He's passed away now. Okay. Yeah, Ajahn, how do I deal with myself sabotaging the meditation? My mind often stops my meditation or jolts me out of it as I get still. Sometimes I subconsciously sabotage it even before I start. <laughs> Jato said it's because the mind is scared to be free. 
Yeah, absolutely. This is fear arising from the fact that I still have considerable lay responsibilities for at least the next decade. If so, do I need to wait until I fulfill my obligations before experiencing a taste of freedom? Thanks no. for the kindness and wisdom. You don't have to wait. And that's the same simile as the person who's been in jail for as long as they can remember, who's now going to be released. Of course they have fear. And they'll try anything to stay inside of jail, because that's what they're used to. So what we do, we have like day release programs. So the prisoner is allowed just to go outside for a few hours and then goes back inside jail again when they feel comfortable. The next time for maybe three or four hours. So you go on retreats. It's like day release programs. So you feel what it's like. It's over two or three days. You're not renouncing becoming a nun or a monk by joining this, joining this retreat. Just experience what it's like. And after a while, you realize there's nothing to fear at all. Great bliss and happiness and peace. And so after a while, you don't mind just renouncing. And you don't sabotage anymore. You don't need to. The opposite happens. You can't wait to get on a retreat. You can't wait to meditation time. And the brain or the mind just leaps towards that. Wow, I don't have to do anything. I can just sit here and relax to the max. Wow. So the mind changes. It gets used to peace and stillness. It's not afraid anymore. It delights in it. Now, over here in Perth, I apologize. I don't know really what to do to solve this problem. But they said that uh, any retreat which I teach over here is filled up in one minute, actually less than a minute. It's all done on sort of line, 60 places, and bang, 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 it's gone. They're all filled up. So what I was doing was we have these other retreats in Perth, and it's organized by uh, the Hong Kong and Indonesians and Singaporean groups. And I thought, just join those, because they're not run by the BSWA, and not many people know about those. But I was just told when I was in Bangkok, that's all cut out now, and so that takes two minutes to fill up. And it's not our retreats, it's somebody else's retreats, but two minutes is all you've got to actually to log in and get a place. <laughs> this is incredibly popular. Why? People got beyond being scared. And just love it. They even send their husbands and wives there. If they're having trouble with their trouble with their their partner, they send them there for a week or two and they come back new and improved. <laughs> <laughs> so we need to invite you back here for a retreat, Ajahn. If you can. One or two or three. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We certainly can. <laughs> I know exactly how to do that. <laughs> <laughs> sometimes but you get sussed out be careful um, even today two groups it's only today my goodness this evening two groups were trying to get me to teach a retreat here and, and one other place I won't say where they are but the and, thing is that is put a bikini singer so this is the best anyway <laughs> here go on keep conditioning me <laughs> you know that Dear Ajahn, at times in meditation, my heart starts racing. I feel a deep, all-consuming anxiety. Is it, it is difficult to separate from the affliction, not mine. Any suggestions? Thank you. Yeah, just catch it early when the mind starts to feel a bit excited. If you can catch it early, it's much easier to stop even. So what I encourage people to do I didn't really have the problem that seriously myself when your mind starts to get peaceful and the body starts to vanish you can imagine that your mind is a screen and maybe keep the breath in the center of the screen and then keep the um, the heart with its heartbeat on the edge of the screen but not the center keep the center on the breathing and then what happens is you focus in in the middle of the screen, which is your breathing at this particular time, then the feeling of the heart falls off the screen. And you're zooming in, and the heart being clean, because it's on the edge, it falls off. You don't feel the heart anymore. If you make the heart the center of the screen, especially because you're worried about it, then the breath falls off. And all you have is boom, 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 very fast and exciting. 
is natural. This is amazing energy, beauty. And of course, you know, what is powerful, we're scared of. We don't know whether we can handle this. It's just too huge for us. And that makes that scariness. Even, I don't mind telling you this, it's only enough five or ten minutes to go. Sometimes if you see meditation teachers with psychic powers, you don't want to see them. Because that really gets the heart pounding. It's, you know, you see this huge power there. And of course it makes you scared, even if you love that monk and you know they're very kind and peaceful. Still the power is just... Uh, and that's one of the reasons why, hi Chanda, please hide your powers. No comment. All right, <laughs> a nice comment now, a very nice comment for you, and I don't think it's a question, so you can just relax. I met you on YouTube some years ago when I was almost bedridden. It was so uplifting. I was so happy when I could sign up for an online retreat thanks to the pandemic, and I keep doing that every time I can. I'm not a Buddhist and I'm a slow learner. I never found such a kind and heartfelt teacher back home. Too many instructions and no Theravadans here. This is in Argentina. So thank you for the patience and the guidance. These days I felt how much strength I do to maintain focus while meditating, and now I know why I get tired. It will take some time, but thank you. Don't give up on online retreats. They mean so much. My heart gets so happy to know Ajahn Brown, Ven Chanda, and now also Ven Upeka are guests in my house and join me in my living room. I feel that every talk is directed in such a personal way and clearing doubts is priceless. Until the day I can knock on your door in the UK, thank you for your time, your metta, and thanks to the organisers. The retreat is so beautiful. It's lovely. There's still a few questions. Shall I go for it? Yeah, go for it. Yeah? Okay. I don't mind going over, but you'll miss your lunch. No, 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 it's yeah. not that. So we've had our lunch. We've got okay. another session after some time. We'll be okay. Okay. Uh, I'm going to just skip the um, questions, of the comments of gratitude for now, but I will okay. send them to Ajahn if we don't read them out. Okay. All right. Dear Ajahn, I'm so thankful for your guided meditations in this retreat. Even though I haven't experienced any nimittas, I've had some of the deepest meditations. My problem is that in the afternoons and evenings, a strong pain in the upper back won't allow me to go into deep meditations. Would you suggest not meditating at all when this pain distracts me so much? Now, I would actually advise this moving slightly, even just finding a different posture even leaning against the wall or um, leaning some other way. I mean, there must be a reason for that pain. And so you know, check out with doctors and stuff to find a reason, a nice cushion or stool or armchair or anything. And it's worthwhile just spending even a bit of funds. I'd even get a dentist chair if that's going to work and you press this button, that button, it goes this way and that way. But eventually, it might be just not so much your posture, but more just another sense of the mind being afraid of what's happening. And it kind of creates this pain. You can try to get into it and find out what's really causing it and overcome it. It'd be beautiful for you. There's one of my monks, okay, it's a bit bigger answer, but I think it deserves a big answer that he was having problem with his back, went to the uh, doctor, had a scan and found that there was something which was a genetic uh, fault in his uh, spine and it couldn't be operated on. But what he did learn was that on either side of his spine there were these muscles which no one really knows about because they don't have to. And he was taught actually to rub his hand on the back of his spine, first on the the right side of the spine, then the left hand side of the spine, so you could get a, a neural contact with those muscles, so you could actually feel them. And once you could feel them, then he was asked to exercise them, to move them up, move them down. And he, he had to learn how to do that by trial and error until he could feel their muscles were actually moving. 
I can't move this. I don't even know they exist because I haven't got that neural connection with them. And they would exercise these every morning for 15 minutes each. And they soon became so strong, much stronger than the muscles, my muscles, the same thing in my back, so strong they fully compensated for the pain in his back. It's a beautiful way of using mindfulness and kindfulness to actually heal that problem. It might work for you. Give it a try. Okay. Okay. I'm struggling to forgive those who bullied someone I love. Do you have any advice on how to cultivate forgiveness and move on? Yes. You don't know why they bullied. Maybe because they were bullied themselves. I just find it too hard to judge people who misbehave, why they do those things. But what I can do is to say to those people I love, have they forgiven yet? Are they forgiven those bullies? And again, once you do forgive, you're a victor, not a victim. I've seen so many beautiful accounts of people who've done such bad things to others. Those others managed to forgive them. And how gorgeous that is. One of those great events was the Truth and Reconciliation Commission in South Africa. And where anybody who would confess truthfully what they did would get amnesty. And this white South African secret police officer was describing how he tortured and killed this man, this black ANC activist. And in front of his widow, all his widow knew that police took him away in the middle of the night. Now she heard for the first time what happened to him. And according to the report, once this white South African police officer completed his testimony, he was shaking, he was crying. It really was an emotional torment for him just to confess it. She was so fast, he jumped over the barriers, avoided two police officers and grabbed this white South African police officer. They all thought it was going to kill him. She just heard how he had killed and tortured her husband, the love of her life. Instead, she just hugged him and said, I forgive you. She hugged him so compassionately. That just shocked everybody. The whole courtroom was boiling with tears. When I first heard that, you can feel as if the, the wetness in the eyes start to happen. And when you heard that someone like that you know, could forgive all the things which each one of us do, well, surely those can be forgiven. And the answer is, of course they can. There's no limit to what can be forgiven. Okay, dear Ajahn and dear Bhikkhunis, thank you so much for your kindness and wisdom. It melted me into a softer, kinder, and wiser human being. And into the meditation, I in the meditation, I fell into nothingness. My question, is it possible to keep the eight precepts after the retreat? I cannot renounce fully right now because I have a 12-year-old son, but I'm committed to the path of liberation. How would a layperson apply the eight precepts in daily life? It makes sure the most important precept is not actually one of the eight precepts, it's just kindness. Please be kindness to your body, kindness to your lifestyle, kindness to your responsibilities by looking after your son. If you can keep the eight precepts, fine, but you don't have to. What you really need is to make sure you keep kindness. And when you're kind to the body and kind to your son, it's amazing just what you can do. Fine, you don't need to. You don't need to you know, look at the internet. You don't need to look at entertainment. But do it with kindfulness. I was thinking the eight precepts is a way to enlightenment and make it just really cool to yourself and your son. Mm -hmm. Okay, this is a popped in question from Venerable Upeka. <laughs> Why do you support Anu Kampa project and how can we support it? Why? This is a no brainer. When it first started, actually, I just even before it started, I was working to make it start and make it happen. And it was because after the Bhikkhuni ordination, like many of you have heard this uh, story before, the Bhikkhuni ordination, which I facilitated in Australia 
simply because there were four wonderful women who just wanted to be bhikkhunis. And I, why not? And so I allowed them to be bhikkhunis. I did the ordination ceremony properly according to the vinaya. Then after that, someone told me that, especially in the UK, I remember what they said, that things were very dark for Buddhist women in Theravada. That's what they said. And they were just, it was a cry of pain. I just couldn't avoid that. And I said, well, I have to do something about that. And what needed to be done was to create a bhikkhuni sangha in uh, UK. Because I created bhikkhuni sangha, I created it. The bhikkhunis had done the creation. I'd just been the facilitator. And it's beautiful to see what happens. It inspires me, no end. I just remember just here in Perth, one of those bhikkhunis, as soon as she became 12 reigns as a bhikkhuni, she could do ordinations. I still remember just going to the first ordination which she performed rather than getting someone from outside to perform. Well, I didn't realize how much it would affect me. It was beautiful. You, you've been part of something which creating history. It's not just history, it's just the ability for every woman on this retreat you know, to realize how powerful this is. Even we made a place where women, they can be ordained. That's, that's hard, but it's not that hard. And then the place which they can live. And this is the first time that they've got a really beautiful place. And many of you have seen it. It's gorgeous. Now we're just going to make sure that you keep supporting it with food and you know whatever else the bhikkhunis need. They're, they're trailblazers, they're pioneers. They're people whose names will go down in history. And I'm sorry, I had chat, that we would have statues made of you sooner or later. <laughs> <laughs> It doesn't make sense at first, but then when it happens to me, I think, what's going on? But you think, that's not why you became a monk for to have statues for you. Do the best you possibly can. And this is what it means to people. It means to each one of you. So don't let this, don't let this go. You can let go of many other things in life, but don't let this gorgeous bikini, uh property and nuns, don't let them go. Look after them to the max. Pamper them. Ask what you really need. You know, you, you heard poor Ayachanda burping at the end of one of those meditations, a poor thing. So we've got to find a way that she can uh, get her health really back up to scratch. And don't sort of burn her out. And I've been very fortunate, honestly, with great health. And sometimes, you know, those deep meditations, they really keep me alive. So you can do some sort of things I should be able to do. But please look after Venal Chanda and Venal Upeka. And so they can have this beautiful life and grow and have more bhikkhunis up in that wonderful property. And it's for your benefit as well as everybody else. You now, you may have women, you know, sisters, daughters, nieces even mums, and they can go over to a place where women are respected. And I say that just because it's crazy that they're not. They're respected enough. You give them the full of equity and opportunity to live their life as the Buddha uh, established so many years ago. All the ordained bhikkhunis. And they do a wonderful job of it. How much have they inspired you? And just that inspiration is just, it is priceless. So please keep supporting them and making sure that, right, this is what I'm doing, and I would always do. You know what I always come up with. I shouldn't. And sometimes my mugs tell me, you've got to spend more time with us. You know, instead of just uh, going out and support because I can't stop it, I'm afraid. You just have to just serve with the service is most respectful, with most helpful and get this monastery to be a beacon of what Buddhism is really about. It's not entitlement, but the ability to serve and to give and inspire and create a much beautiful world. 
And that's why I, I can't stop myself. <laughs> awesome. Um, are you up for one more or two more little questions? Or three. three. All, right. Got to three. Four. All right. I'm so inspired and amused by the way you offer teachings using similes, funny stories, and jokes. I have a question about the teaching you gave us this morning. What's the difference between measuring chitta and cultivating chitta? Is cultivating a proper verb when it comes to talk about meditation? It can be at the beginning, but eventually we cultivate things to disappear. So they vanish. So there's no chitta left. There's no body left. It's called cessation. That may be scary to some people. But that's actually what we're doing. You become a loser, I like saying. So there's less of you every year. And the less of you there is as you vanish more and more the more beautiful it is. Ajahn Chah was an amazing loser. Lost everything. Okay, dear okay. Abraham, how should I do with freedom from desire when I want my business to succeed? Well, if you have freedom from desire, you'll eventually become a monastic. <laughs> you just can't help it. That's just where you belong. Your business to succeed, you know, why? You've done that so many lifetimes. Now you want your business to succeed again. So what does succeed mean? It just keeps on growing, 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 growing. You want to be like another Elon Musk or another Steve Jobs or another, I don't know who the other business people are. But sometimes the business people, they get separated from the, from the real world. You can't just go for a walk in the shops and just, or just walk down the road and just say hello to everybody. It kind of, if you're really successful, it secludes you from reality. Maybe I shouldn't say that because maybe you're thinking of giving a big donation to Anna Kump and now I've stuffed it for you. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> uh, there was a little nice feedback, which I thought I'd read out. Okay. I want to deeply thank Ajahn Brown, Venchanda and the team and all the people who participated in this retreat. Thank you, Ajahn Brown, for your capacity for compassion, which makes me feel at home, completely relaxed, confident and without fear. Since I follow his teachings, I can manage the situations of everyday life while still feeling safe in the small cave that I create in the space of the heart with loving kindness and total silence from thoughts. Excellent. Well done. Someone else says, thank you so much for your kind meditation guidance. I enjoy and benefit a lot from these sessions. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. Look forward to next retreats to come. Please remember the retreat isn't over yet. Mm -hmm. It's just coming close to my bedtime. So I'm going to disappear. There's more talks and questions and answers and final chanting later on for each one of you. Is that correct? That's correct. So what's going to happen now is you can all have a rest if you so desire, or you can have lunch and then you can have a rest. And then at three o'clock today, there will be a silent meditation with Matthias uh, for 45 minutes. And at four o'clock, we come back for the closing session. So if you do join the silent session, please don't log out. If you don't join the silent session, please log in at quarter to four. And we'll have a closing session with a little reflection, some more meditation and some discussion together as well. So. It'll be a really nice way to end the retreat and you might get the chance to meet one another too. Okay, so uh, thanking you very much um, on behalf of everyone at Ajahn for being with us and uh, bye bye for all your support in every way. <laughs> ah, that's great.